Hey everyone. Sorry, we're a couple minutes late there, just getting our ducks in a row, but thank you for joining us for today's YouTube Live webinar. Our topic today is how to estimate lighting control systems for commercial electrical projects. And I just wanted to upfront explain a little bit about how you can participate during the webinar. There's the chat off to the right. If you're logged into YouTube, you can ask us questions or, you know, just comment however you like or underneath the the video you're watching right now there's a link to a google form you can submit your question there and we'll get to your questions as we move forward here and i want to introduce myself derek de la quadri i'm the president of vision infosoft and we have quite a few guests today you know brian hoffelder he, he's here today is our uh training and software development expert and we have two special guests the Kendells. Mark and Linda Kendall's are here. Their company, Kendall's Estimating, was started 19 years ago, and they are going to take us through today's presentation. And I also wanted to mention they have a new service that they're going to go over today towards the end of the webinar. So hang out, and we'll get to that. It's an estimating training service that's brand new and one of a kind. So I'd like to bring it over to you, Mark and Linda, to kind of take us through this uh, presentation. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, again, I'm Mark Candels, along with my partner in crime, Linda Candels. Hello. And uh, we own Candels Electrical Estimating and Training. We're going to talk about lighting controls today and how it relates to the Vision InfoSoft product and also Epic Pricing. So we're going to just kind of cruise over the definition <laughs> of lighting controls because lighting controls is really a very vast I guess definition or whatever, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> it's anything that controls lights. <clears throat> so here we have switches, dimmers, um, all types of you know devices that you have that are pretty pretty standard here. And also, I just want to point out, hey, you know, if you got questions, shout out, throw your questions up on the uh, the chat there, and uh, we'll answer them as we go. So, Linda, uh, what do we always say when we talk about what we see in the symbol list never assume that it's a standard symbol yeah you know because, what you're right Ab absolutely. because some some engineers get cute and you think you're looking at a key switch and it's actually something entirely different um i don't know why people veer off the standard path but occasionally they do so don't let it bite you in the in the keister there look at look at the symbol list and make sure you know what you're taking off Exactly. So here we have um, a, a legend that was on a job, and they actually gave you all the subscripts off to the off to the right here. We're going to kind of cook through some of these samples. You know, uh, lighting controls can be single pole switch, three way switch, key switch, four way switches, and all the appropriate wiring. You know, we have pilot switches. You know, you got an S with a P. Um, sometimes you'll have an S with a T. Some people think they're um, tamp or uh, some kind of uh, uh, toggle switch or um, thermal rated switch. We have an S with an M. That's a momentary contact. So again, we're going to toggle maybe a, uh, a contact or something like that. And we've got some more time switches, dimmer switches. And again, we have a four-way switch in here. But uh, one of the switches that a lot of people don't think about is explosion-proof switches or weatherproof switches. So we like to uh, we like to bring those out when we're talking about lighting controls. Um, you know, this is, this is one of the areas where we have a, a pro tip where we always say, read the specs, you know, what kind of devices are they looking for? Especially, um, device plates, you know, we have plastic plates, metal plates, paintable plates, uh, stainless steel switches, plates, decorator, like the decora. And let's not forget the really expensive, like the Lutron or the screwless covers. Those are and really expensive. And they are. And then we have multi-gang switches. And I know Brian, when I've taken Brian's classes in the past, he's always an advocate of make sure you count your one gang, your one gangs and your two gangs and the three gangs. Because, you know, you don't count them all as individual. You want to make sure if you've got a two-gang switch, you've got two single poles within the within that box. Or and the then, of course, you have your two-gang plate or exactly. your four-gang plate. 
Exactly. So when and those you, can be quite expensive. So you think about if you were carrying the cost of a single gang plate like four times, it's going to be a lot less money than a four gang plate, which you're supposed to carry. So right. And it kind of throws off your estimate and what you're going to buy later. You know, a lot of people they take that estimate, you know, cradle to grave, and they're going to go buy what's in that estimate. So if you've got a lot of one gang switch plates. And really, they should have been a combination of two gang, three gang, four gang switches. What are you buying now? So you're, you're really buying the wrong bill of material. And that's why it's really handy, especially in ABM, to take them off correctly. That's right. So also lighting controls, we have photo cells. We have time clocks. And again, read the specs on time clocks because they can get quite pricey. Uh, some of these astronomical um, time clocks can be $1,000. Again, if you're doing a takeoff, either send that out to supplier or open up, you know, Epic pricing and get in there and, and check the pricing. You know, Epic's going to be pretty, pretty, um, pretty close to what you're going to end up buying it for, including freight. Uh, and again, check for availability. If they specify a, a, a time clock, you know, the key is, you know, if they specify it, make sure that they actually can get it these days. It's not like it was two years ago where there was an abundance of time clocks or lighting controls, you've got to see what's in stock because you may have to qualify your bid that they don't make this, that they don't have this time clock available anymore. You know, we want to offer a substitution. And that's the great part, again, about Epic pricing because you can look at the or equals, right, Brian? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, handy to have. So mm -hmm. other lighting controls is we have lighting contactors and then we have lighting control panels. And then we get into the low voltage stuff, which is really the meat and potatoes that we want to talk about today. So we have, you know, line voltage or a low voltage occupancy sensor. And um, you're going to have to read the specs of and, and the drawings, too, of, you know, how do I know if it's a line voltage wall mount ox sensor or a low voltage one? And one of the key tips is, are there power packs or how big of an area is it going to control you know if it's just a small little closet you can get by with a line voltage 120 volt 277 volt occupancy sensor in the wall or even one up on the ceiling um, but if it's a large vast area we're going to need multiple power packs so chances are the the ox sensors or the the uh, the sensors themselves are going to be low voltage controlling those power packs so then we have a vacancy center so, you know, the, the vacancy sensor versus an occupancy sensor. Um, Linda, is there a difference or isn't there? Or is it just a play on words? I personally think it's a play on words. I, one, I, I, one, I do too. one says somebody's there and one says somebody's not there. Yeah. And it's really the same thing, only said differently. That's right. So then you have your, you know, what we didn't really talk about in our PowerPoint is passive infrared versus... Um, uh, what's the other one there? I'm drawing a complete blank here. Um, Multi-technology. Yeah, the uh, dual technology. Dual sorry. technology, sorry. So, um, you know, I'll just mention that real quick. When we're talking about the sensors and when you want to figure out what types of sensors are specified, you have um, infrared, which it sees you, right? It doesn't hear you, it just sees you. And then you have the passive infrared. So it listens for you and sees you. So if you see a PIR in front of the the um, the device or in the specifications, uh, those are handy for big areas with maybe cubicles, or if you've got large bathrooms where you get stalls. You know that that device is going to listen for you and hear and see you. You know, so if you got a big wide open area like a warehouse, all you need is just pass it, or all you need is just passive infrared because it'll see you. But if you got a lot of barriers in the way, you you want the dual technology there. Hopefully, I said that correctly. Um, then we have these low voltage control switches. We're going to see them on a we're going to see them on a riser coming up here. But um, you know these are very common. These low voltage uh, control switches where they're going to have like a a switch bank somewhere. And uh, in this picture here, we see we have zones one through six with an on off there, so we can turn on and isolate areas. So that's all done through a Cat5 cable that I believe Brian's going to show us a little bit later on how we put, the, you know, a sample of how we're going to take them off and put them in the system here. But um, 
when we look at these, I'm actually going to go to the riser, which I believe is the next slide over here. Uh, this would be a typical lighting control riser. And this is where uh, an estimator or, you know, even, a, you know, a small contractor that's, you know, got the estimating program and he gets this riser and they get overwhelmed. So, um, Linda, why don't you tell us how we kind of introduced you into lighting controls? Because I remember years ago throwing Linda into the deep end saying, hey, go take it, do a takeoff on this lighting control riser. And, and I was, I was literally overwhelmed. Like, what do I do with this? But really, what's interesting is the occupancy sensors are normally shown on the drawings or the lighting control panels. And then there may be other modules that aren't shown that are shown on the riser, which you just have to make sure that you put some um, labor to. And of course, you don't have to include the material price because it's going to be part of a quoted system. And then all the, all the rest of it is, is just, the wire and it's usually cat five or if they they may specify some other kind of wire but it's really not as complicated because if something's not shown like say for example a control module of some sort then maybe you decide that you're going to throw 75 or 100 feet at it and that's literally you're just trying to cover the cost you you don't have to be exact in your bill of material because this is an estimate it's not an exactimate so you know once you get a couple of these under your belt you're like you know something that you thought was going to take you hours to do literally can be done in less than a half an hour yeah maybe and, even 15 minutes it's just a simple you're going to get that device that six button scene control switch or area switch it's it's really going to be maybe a stub up above the ceiling or just a plastering on the wall with a cat five cable going down there. And you're going to land those eight wires on the back of that device, terminate it, screw it to the wall and you're done and let the, the, um, you know, the programmers program the device back at the head end. So it's really that simple. Same thing with an occupancy sensor. You know, you're going to have a low voltage cable going over to it. Maybe it's just a 16.2 or or it could be a Cat5 cable. You know, again, you got to pay attention to the riser here. And uh, you'll have on this riser that you see, you have these little triangles there. And each triangle corresponds to a particular cable. I can't really zoom in on it, but uh, you kind of get the the gist of it here. So, again, you're going to mount that device onto a, onto a box or a plastering or even just a couple of zip it screws into the ceiling there and land that cable in the back of the device they can be that simple you know all the all the work really is at the head and the panel landing all the wires onto the proper onto the proper zones um, and again that'll all be designed in coordination with the the lighting co control um, vendor so and they'll have it all programmed all you does just run the wires and land the devices so let's uh, move on to our next slide here. And okay, so speaking of wiring, you know, we talked about Cat5 cable. Um, Lutron systems, they have their own um, proprietary cable. They call it the GRX cable. And they've got a couple different versions of the types of cables that they use. And I'm just using uh, that as an example. Uh, there's some other great um you know, lighting control companies out there as well, besides Lutron, but that's just one of the bigger names that people um, use. But um, the new thing that's been out for, oh, about five, six years now is LED lighting. And the nice thing about LED lighting is you can dim them, you can control them. Uh, you can actually have areas where all the light fixtures on the outside walls where you have windows can be zoned. So you can have them brighter or not as bright. So maybe during the day when the sun's out, you'll have an, a photo cell sensor, again, a low voltage sensor going back to the, uh, the going back to the lighting control panel saying, hey, everything in the, the within 10 feet of the, the glass here, we want to dim it down to next to nothing because it's bright enough outside. And that's all part of that energy management savings um, that you daylight, see out there. Daylight harvesting. Exactly. Thank you, Linda. Daylight harvesting. So how do we achieve daylight harvesting? Well, we're using a product called Luminary Cable. So it's an MC cable or it's a Romex, non-metallic Romex cable. And it's got your typical black, white, green as you need for power. 
right? And then we have a control cable and it's a 16-2 generally, you know, encased in that cable. It's a hybrid cable. And that low voltage piece just daisy chains between all light fixtures. So again, you can control the fixtures individually. So you can actually um, daisy chain them all. Each fixture uh, gets wired back to a zone. Um, you wire them all in the, into a zone and you can control them on and off and dim them accordingly. You can also change colors. So maybe if you want a brighter at night in a, in a, in a I guess a cooler or, or, or hotter color. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Linda. When we get up in the bright, bright, you know, 5,000 Kelvin versus the, the lower 3,200 Kelvin, what's more of a yellowish color, uh, you know, the brightness. So you can adjust those as well through these um, these lighting systems. Um, Br Brian, did you want to, do you, you want to just take a, show us what um, EBM has for, Luminary cables, would we want to take like a light fixture off or something like that? Yeah, that'd be perfect. My screen's up, Derek? Yep. Okay. So I've put a, this is the fixture takeoff module on EBM. You assign letter, number, combination letters and numbers to each fixture, A1, B1, F1, whatever it is. Now I've selected an LED here. Whoops, that's not the one I wanted. Let's start over. Sorry. I already had one set up, so I'm going to say, we'll call it A2. And then under the description here, oh, good grief. I got an A2 already. Okay, let's start that over. Sorry about that. We're going to do a Z1. I know there's no Z1 on this job. So I'm going to go to description. I'm going to do LED. I'm going to do a lay-in. And I'm going to do a 2 by 4 Now down here under accessories, we can include things like a box or a any other kind of mounting materials, but we have this little tab for conduit wire and cable. And when I go to cable, I can pick the, the standard MC cable up at the top or down here under luminary cable, we've got the 12-2 with the 16-2 Mark was talking about. Then if I put in 20 feet per fixture, let's say we're going to put in 40 of those, and then every one of those fixtures will get 20 feet of the luminary cable. That's all there is to it. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Yep. You know, so it's not, it's, you know, when people say, see that luminary cable, you know, they, they're like deer in the headlights. They just freeze up and, you know, it's just, what do I do? Okay. You know, it's just, it's a cable with some terminations. So, you know, the LED lighting fixture may have a little bit more labor to it because you've got another pair of wires to land on it, but it's very, very minor. But, uh, you know, it's and just, it it is expensive. <laughs> it, it sure is. Yeah. Uh, I was pricing up Romex uh, for a client that was doing, a, actually, Linda was working a very high-end home, um, and the, all the light fixtures were, were wired in a luminary cable. And I almost fell over. It was almost a, over a dollar a foot for Romex, so mm -hmm. everything's up there, too. So, All right, so um, we'll get back to our PowerPoint here. So this is the MC cable luminary uh, type. And it combines both power and control circuits under one armor. And uh, these cables are per they're primarily used in commercial construction. Um, we do a lot of casinos with them. I haven't seen too many condos, but I know a lot of hotels that do them, shopping centers. And that's going to be more for the architectural type lighting when you want to when you want to change zones and controls and what have you. And then we have the the accompanying um, cable in in an NMB or a Romex type cable and uh, they use, again, a lot of smart buildings here. So uh, Southwire makes a product. They call it the, the PCS Duo Cable. Other, pair, other companies call it Luminary, and they all have their acronym for it. So, But it's pretty much the same cable here. So let's talk about a little bit more about uh, the controls. You know, We've got that low-voltage um, lighting, but somehow you're going to need a driver for them. So maybe you're not going to run 120 volts or 277 volts to these lights. We also have lights that can be run off of what they call power over Ethernet. So you can run a Cat5 cable and daisy chain in and out of them, and they're actually controlled through drivers. And what controls the drivers? The lighting control system of the panel. That, again, that may be just a data cable going back um, to that control panel. That data cable communicate, communicates with these drivers, 
Uh, maybe it'll bring 110 volts into it just to feed the power pack of the driver. And then low voltage goes out and daisy chains all these lights. And again, that's all through drivers. And again, pay attention to that riser because every system operates slightly differently. So don't assume. Okay, so what we're talking about is lighting control effects. You know, the, the what's and the how's. So what are we trying to do? We're trying to produce the right amount of lighting. How are we going to do that? By brightness or dimming. You know, we can make the lights brighter. We can dim them, right? Where is it needed? Uh, well, we're going to zone the lighting to the controllers. We're going to zone the areas. So we're going to use controllers to zone all these things. And then when is it needed? Well, we, maybe we need to automatically adjust the lighting when it's unoccupied, right? Vacant, uh, as Linda and I discussed earlier, is it occupancy or when it's occupied or is it vacant? Uh, and then maybe we want to talk about when it's really bright outside, when we talk about that daylight harvesting. So, and again, remember, if you have questions, let's post them up there now. Let's not wait till the end there. Let's get them populated and then uh, Derek can hop in and, and uh, intervene here. So uh, what else when we're talking about the what's and how's, right? Lighting controls are evolving every day. Every day they change. You know, you go to the supply house and there's always a lighting rep out there showing a new product that they just came out. You know, uh, we go to the trade shows. We'll go to the NECA show, the IEC show, and all the other shows out there. The the Bixie shows. You got the, uh, the all the, the lighting shows. There's always something new out there. It's evolving every day. Technology is incredible. So, again, we're trying to what? Produce the light at the right color, the shade of the color, right? So uh, if we're in a casino, uh, Linda, Linda loves this because we actually did a lot of work in several casinos. And at night, you know, they'll actually raise the lighting to get you to think it's still bright outside. They'll mentally yep. mess with you to get you to think it's still early. So you stay at the tables longer, right? Well, they I... Do one place that I think is really cool is the Venetian, if you've ever been there. And when you go out to that place that looks like an Italian piazza, and it's always twilight there. It's always dusk, you know. Um, and, and you think it's, you know, just the sun has just gone down and it's early evening. And I've been there at 10 o'clock at night and been totally messed up because I think it's still, you know, 7, 7.30. And it, it gets you to stay longer so it, they they can use that that lighting to control not lighting controls to not only control lighting but to control people's behavior which yep. is interesting uh, absolutely uh derek did we have a question that just popped up yep 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 how many lights can be on a power pack and that is a great question william and um it all depends on the system right lights led lighting you could be looking at rope light or tape light or or linear lighting and it's maybe three watts a foot a watt and a half a foot and then you've got to upsize the the power pack appropriately you know you can get um, various different power pack sizes so again i would defer that question back to the lighting vendor so when we do a takeoff we'll make some assumptions i'll just say hey look we can get so many feet. I can get like 40 feet of LED lighting, you know, maybe cove lighting on a power pack. But I'm not going to assume that. What I try to do is I go back to the lighting rep and say, hey, look, Mr. Lighting Rep, I've got so many feet of lights. I've got so many lay-in two-by-twos, so many two-by-fours. Uh, you're specifying the product. You tell me how many power packs we need. Um, but, uh, William, if, if you're doing something small, you know, just when you go to supply, I'll say, hey, look, how many feet can I put on this power pack? And just verify with them. You know, it's it's not as not an easy question as 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 we think it could be. So getting back to our what's and how's. OK, so we can produce the light at the right color or shade. So we can separately dim zones of the LEDs with different colors of white lighting correlated with temperatures. Right. So we can have bright lights and then we can accent the lights on the outside wall or uh, an, ac uh, an accent wall that um, that you want to change the colors and have a, like a warmer lighting on that. Uh, we did uh, a restaurant where they had birch trees. Really, they cut down birch trees and they had them decorative and they would change the scene, the walls to the seasons. 
So in the fall, it would be, you know, bright oranges and reds, and it looked like you were in this fall setting. In the middle of winter, they brought it up bright, nice and white, the snow. And and uh, in the summer, they'd make it look bright, like, uh, you know, different colors of the sun. So you can do a lot with lighting controls. And it's really neat to, if you pay attention to what the what the scope is, uh, it, it'll it, it's interesting to... Uh, to see. So what else? Uh, we can allow remote programming and control. So you can have, uh, you know, your iPhones, your iPads, you have apps, there's an app for it. There's an app for everything out there these days. You know, um, I looked at a job yesterday, they have electric heated toilet seats. And there's an app for it. <laughs> I, I, I almost fell over. I was actually looking at a job yesterday. And there was an app for electric heated toilet seats. I, I almost fell over. And the, and, the, and the craziest part is it was in, it's in Florida. Yeah. It's not like we're talking Alaska. <laughs> Crazy. People are building a multi, multi million dollar home and they have an app for the heated toilet seats. So, okay. So Just a we quick can little, read, uh, moving little right story on. there, Mark. I, I yeah. bought a uh, portable heater. Oh, about the two ago from Costco. Yeah, I brought it home and and it, I looked at it and there's there's no remote control for this. It was supposed to have a remote control. It was an app. You had to download the app and then you you turned it on and off and set the temperature and the all the uh, controls with your app on your phone for a little fifty dollar heater. <laughs> yeah, and you know, Linda and I built a new home uh, just over two years ago and we bought all these paddle fans, and um, come to find out, they didn't come with controls either. They had an app for it. Mm -hmm. And the funny part is you had to use, you know, you got to combine them all. There was, there was um, apps out there where you could combine all the fans. So you'd have them all come on at once or off and you could take the lights on and off with the LED lighting controls. You could dim yeah. them. Uh, the, the problem was we had, we, we changed our Wi-Fi password once and it took us weeks to get everything fixed. <laughs> uh, so that's, you know, a disadvantage to having an app here. So, uh, you know, how uh, control systems with programming and lighting management capabilities, you can you can do all these uh, programming with it and um, uh, and tell how your lights are performing. You know, some of these apps, especially the really high end lighting control systems will actually tell you, hey, uh, uh, Derek, um, you've been using these two by four lights and they're, 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 we're starting has some wear and tear on them. You know, you're not at 100 percent anymore. You know, they're the the you're down to like 98 or 95% um, efficient now. So maybe we want to change the color to adjust for that inefficiency. So these apps are really smart. The lighting control systems are getting really smart. Um, it, it's interesting. It's going to be interesting to see in the next couple of years too, how things evolve here. So uh, we got more hows and whys here. Okay, here we go. So um, benefits. You know the visual visual needs as you can see in this picture here we've got it wider to the left and then we've got medium and then we've got warmer to the right so we it looks like we have a hospital or something like that and maybe you want the people to feel cooler out in the lobby and then maybe you know you can adjust it so here we go we we, we can start off with a 55 um what's that 100 kelvin there and then, you know, we go to the 3,800 Kelvin, that's dim to 75%. And then we go down to 50%. You know, we're combining brightness, the, the color with dimness too. So again, that's all done through lighting controls. So it's great for changing space appearance, you know, facilitate different functions on the space. You can take a space and make it multifunctional just by changing the lighting control system. It's, it's interesting. So uh, you can alter the atmosphere of the mood, you know. Um, maybe if somebody's not feeling well in the, in the hospital bed, you can brighten them up. You know, you can cheer them up. So, uh, you know, changing colors of lights can change your mental, your mental, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, vision, I guess. All right. So, uh, and again, increase the user satisfaction by providing the users the ability to control their lighting. Um, let's move on to the next slide. We have here. a question. Oh, we have a question. Excellent. Yep. Mark asks, with some projects requiring a five-year control, 
let me put it up here, five-year control warranty and programming trip costing around $1,000 from the factory. Have you seen estimators adding to their bids to cover the warranty? And that's a great question, Mark. Um, we teach just that in our estimate class when we talk about uh, writing your proposal letter, right? You have a specification now that's calling for a five-year control warranty on this project. That means, Mark, your company has to honor for the next five years anything that happens to the system. Now, it may not require your time, but your lighting control vendor that you purchase this through, they're going to have to cover that cost as well. And you're going to have to cover some additional time for it. You need to you need to um, throw some money in there for it. Uh, getting back to time clocks, when I talked about time clocks earlier, one of the examples that we used in our training program is, is there was an architect or an engineer that specified a particular brand uh, time clock. And the spec called for a three-year warranty on that time clock. Well, the manufacturer, I'll just use a name, Intermatic, whoever it was, they only come with a one-year warranty. So how do we achieve a three-year warranty on a product that only comes from the factory with a one-year warranty and you can't buy the additional one-year warranty? Um, what I always explain to students is if it's a $1,000 time clock, maybe you need to buy two of them, carry two in your bid, put one on the shelf, and then you know, you're gambling. You know, it's like an insurance policy, whether, you're gonna whether it's going to fail or not. And then after three years, you've got an extra time clock. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing with this this uh, five-year control warranty. You're going to have to cover something because you own it. So in your bid, you know, anticipate something happening. And you know, there's some people out there that will hold you to it and and say, "Hey, look, I'm not sure." You know, you coming up in that five-year warranty, and they're going to call you back. Say, I'm not sure if this was working right. Can you come out and take a look at? It? They just want to make sure they get the money out of you, and there was really nothing wrong with it. But uh, you know, there's there's all kinds of games, but that that's definitely something. You're going to want to think about, and when you buy the system, if it's in the specification, you make sure that that quote comes with that, you know, five-year warranty. So that's something you want to, you want to watch. Uh, that's a great question, Mark. Thank you. So let's see, we're going to continue on. This is, we're actually getting to the end of our PowerPoint here, but um, control zoning, you know, here we got, we got a zone A, a zone D, a B, and C, and you can break down office areas into zones all right so maybe the people i'll just use uh i'll use a uh for example linda back in the 80s after graduating college she worked for otis elevator so she worked um in the area for the call center all right so let's just say zone a was the call center that's manned 24 7 so if you're in the elevator and you accidentally hit that emergency button it's going to ring the otis elevator call center and ring 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 hi it's linda um, you want those lights on, but zone B, C, B, C, and D, those people have gone home for the weekend. They're home. So those lights don't need to be on. So we can break up the zones. Mm -hmm. And again, that, that outer perimeter of the building, we can actually do some daylight harvesting and break out those areas again to help save energy. So, and then you get the zone E, which is the common hallways, um, and the elevator, uh, lobby there. So maybe those areas, we're going to have some additional controls like, occupancy sensors maybe at night all the lights go off and then as people start walking down the halls lights come on because we have occupancy sensors or vacancy sensors however you want to look at it so um you can break break the buildings up into zones and uh, the, you know the control system is great you know they're smart you don't need to turn on the whole floor of this high rise because somebody's walking in zone a so that's why you want to break the areas up the zones so it's an important aspect of lighting control systems and design as zoning is the mechanism through which lighting controls are assigned to the lighting loads. You know, so um, that, that can, that can um, be very helpful. So um, I believe we got another question, Derek. Yeah, we got a comment. We got a comment regarding the uh, warranty. Jim, hey, we, Gary, okay, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Derek. I'm taking sorry, the okay. from that. Ah, how dare you? Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Uh, Jim uh, says, we carry additional costs for extended warranty and to cover a certain amount of callback based on statistical probability of failure rate. Yeah, that's, that's, that's why you that's why you always keep historical data 
um, on your projects. So if you, you can kind of anticipate, you know, the past is a good indicator of the future. So if you keep, you know, good notes and you, you will be able to anticipate those, those um, statistical probabilities like Jim just mentioned. That's a really good comment. Yeah, it sure is. Absolutely. So, um, you know, all these systems, you know, they roll back to a control panel somewhere. Some, and most of them are software driven. So here we've got uh, a Lutron, uh, looks like an iPad. Uh, a lot of times they'll take these and they'll mount them right to the wall. Uh, have some kind of, you know, years ago, it used to be an iPhone that used to be mounted up there. Now they're getting bigger into iPads. So here we've got, we can, we can, um, we can adjust schedules, daylights. We can even control shades, open the shades, close the shades, you know, Hey, um, we're going to, uh, this classroom, we're going to show a movie. Now teacher goes over to the iPad on the, at the front at the, at the desk says, close the shades, dim the lights. She may have a mode set up for watching a movie. Um, she may, she may have a, there may be a schedule in that knows that this class goes to lunch at 12, 15 every day. So at 12, 16, it dims all the lights, maybe turns them off and leaves maybe one or two random on there. And it can be overridden with, you know, an occupancy sensor or vacancy sensor. Oh, the kids came back or the teacher came back. The lights came back up and it'll sense, okay, she's gone. We can bring it back down because the schedule says we're going to keep these lights off. You know, the whole thing is about saving energy. And in this picture here, you see that we're saving 25% right now because, you know, it, it's showing you the savings, which is, it's one of those happy feel goods. Uh, out there. So various apps and software support implementation of lighting control systems. You know, the most robust software is available for centralizing your intelligent network lighting control systems. You know, most of it's residing on a server or on the cloud. A lot of this is, you know, you have these apps go out to a cloud. The software may provide many functions such as, you know, the discovery of the control points. <clears throat> so let's just say we're going to add uh, a new uh, occupancy sensor in this area that was just renovated. You know, you may turn it just like a Bluetooth, put it in discovery mode. The app's going to find it, turn it on, program it. It can be that simple. So you can assign it control points to zones. You can program the sequences of operations for zones. You can calibrate the sensors. You can actually put what we call pet alleys in these zones. So if you have a, an office cat, as we have here at Candell's, we don't want the office cat turning on the lights in the middle of the night. So um, we actually, there's an actual zone through the app where you can say, you know, everything four feet or under, turn off until the cat jumps up on the desk. And that's a different story. So we actually blocked out the desk and that turned into another, another problem because when you sat at your desk and it would turn the lights off because you were blocked out in that zone. So you just got to find that happy medium or keep the cat locked up. So um uh, you know, calibrate sensors. You can monitor the control points and issue service alerts and alarms. You know, if a device is not working, it's going to report back and say, hey, we've got a problem with the system here. So that's handy to have. And then again, these this data, since it's on the cloud, it can be backed up and event logs are, are created. Uh, and you can also um, create access and user logs and levels too of what, hey, um, Linda's coming in to work because it's Saturday. She only has access to certain areas of the system. She can go up to the iPad there and, uh, you know, tell her what to do. So um, that, I believe, uh, we'll, we'll go over the, some other things. Brian, do you have any more that, um, that you have another? To we have another question. Yep. We do. I'm letting so Brian we'll, do his job. We'll, we'll come back sorry, to Brian in, in a second here. Uh Jim added, are, are you finding in your commercial projects that the mechanical BAS ties into a lot of the electrical systems? And yes, the, the answer is yes. The building automation system, the energy management system, uh, the BMS, building, mechanic, uh, building management systems, all these acronyms out there, we're seeing that a lot. And a lot of them, you know, they're, they're intertwined. Um, some of the, some of the larger buildings, you'll have like an energy management vendor, like a Siemens or uh, Johnson controls, they'll go in and they'll cover all the lighting controls. And then the electrician may just have to terminate uh, the, the devices. You know, every project's different, but
But uh, yes, Jim, we're seeing that a lot, especially on the larger projects where they want to control the occupancy sensors, the vacancy sensors with the HVAC system. If nobody's in the room, why are we keeping this place down to 71? We can bring it up to 75, 76, 77, or why we run the heat when nobody's there. You know, uh, the cat doesn't need the heat, believe me. So, um, yeah, you want to control the mechanical systems. You know, if you've got these systems are so smart, all right, maybe if there's stagnant air because the window, the, um, the shades are all up and it's really hot, maybe they want to turn on the fans to keep some air moving. So, um, there's uh there's a lot to those systems. They're smart, smart systems. <clears throat> All right, and we have another one, and we will um, pause here and and give you some more uh, some other information while you think of other questions. But we're going to do this one more question here, and then we'll jump into some extra information. Instead of using luminary MC cable, are there instances where you would run standard MC and a separate LV <clears throat> cable from a fixture? And the answer to that is yes. Uh, it, it's, you know, when they start, first came out with the LED controlled lights, uh, they were just running Cat5 cable and just crimping on RJ45 and just plugging them into the fixtures. Uh, then they came out with this luminary cable, which was a combined hybrid cable with both in there. But uh, yes, John, you can, you, can, you can use two individual cables. Um, you got to look at the cost cost versus benefit, you know, is, is buying luminary cable more cost effective than pulling two cables. And then think about that labor, you know, is there a labor adjustment to pull one cable versus two cables? So you got to go back and look at and, and play with it, you know, to do a takeoff, um, take off, uh, 50, hundred lights with a luminary cable and play with the cost of that. And then take off an MC cable and a 16, two, um, cable or cat five cable or whatever's required, put the ends on it and see what's more cost effective because it may be cost effective, John, to just run those two separate cables. You know, you got it's, it's a play with numbers. And the nice thing is right. you can, you can do it two different ways in your system. But you got to look at what the specs say also. That's a very mm. good point. It's a very good point. When they Make first sure came out, with the these, specs. that's right. Because when they first came out with the, controlled systems, the question became, can I pull that low voltage cable in the conduit with my 120 or my 277 volt THHN or my wire? And everybody, a lot of people jumped up and down and said, no, you can't. Um, well, they do make cables that's rated for one, you know, that, that has the same insulation rating as your THHN or THWN that you can put it in the same raceway. So you got to pay attention to that. But like Linda said, read the specs pay attention to that. And then if there's, if the specs are, you know, more, um, open that you can work with, you know, play, play the number, see which one's going to be more cost effective, you know, cause all the bottom line is it's all about being profitable, making, making money, but also offering a quality project that's cost that's code compliant and, and meets the, uh, end users needs and requirements as well. <clears throat> so, um, Brian, right. did, or, um, uh, Derek, do you want to take this one or? Um, yeah, so we have the contact information up here and I wanted to give Brian a moment to mention upcoming electrical bid manager training that he will be hosting. Yeah, we, <clears throat> we've actually got classes coming up next week in Tampa on Tuesday and Wednesday. Some introductory classes, some advanced classes. We have a class where we actually take off a, a complete 11,000 square foot building from beginning to end. And then uh, in, you can check our website. We've got classes coming up in Austin later in April. And then we'll have classes in Las Vegas in the second week of May. So those are all in person. And we also do virtual classes once a month. Again, check our website for the, 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 the classes and the, the dates. But once a month, we offer the introductory classes, the advanced class, the takeoff lab class. We do all those virtual, and we're also doing doing them in person too. Excellent. Yep. So check out that's visioninfosoft.com for a training on our software. And Mark and Linda, I, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us today and 
putting together this presentation because I know it's something that we get asked about here at Vision from our customers, and it just seemed like a perfect topic for you guys to cover. Sure. Well, oh, thank you. And um, you're welcome. And you know, we love participating in these things. I think we went a little bit longer than you you asked us for, but uh, you know, we wanted to make sure we got the info out and pl had plenty of time to answer the questions. And just a little plug about uh, Candell's estimating oh, training. Please. We are a complete outsourced electrical estimating firm. We've been in business since 2003, and we work for electrical contractors all over North America. So no job is too small, too large. We do use the uh, EBM program, so uh, we like using that. And Among we also have a to be safe, to be uh, to be fair. Yeah, we we use almost all of them. We use almost all of the programs out there. Uh, we also have an electrical uh, estimating training academy. So it's an online uh, program where you can learn how to estimate. It's about 100 hours worth of video training. It's a learning management system where you're going to go through modules. You're going to take quizzes. You're going to do homework assignments. And it comes with our accompanying um, book. It's, we wrote about a 500-page estimating book that goes along with the program, so you can follow along. And uh, it's, it's a great program if you want to learn how to estimate and do it right. And, uh, you know, it's great to to be part of the uh, Vision InfoSoft program today. I want to thank you, everybody. Yeah. Linda, do you I, have anything else? Oh, sorry, Linda. I didn't want to interrupt. No, I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Oh, I was just going to say that when when Mark and Linda first told me about this class, the uh, on-demand and the community that they're creating, uh, it I, I, I loved it because I, I know that there is kind of a hole for that type of a service, and they filled it. And I know there's a, there's a – I don't know what the number is. I don't know. Maybe you guys do, but – there aren't enough electrical estimators, good electrical estimators, maybe I could should add. And your program helps grow that or eliminate that problem or at least reduce it. So I, I, do, I well, definitely recommend. Yeah, I definitely that, recommend that, that, that you go our, look that. That is our goal. The uh, Department of Labor and Bureau Statistics um, has a study out there right now. They're saying it's about 18,700 openings for electrical estimators nationwide in the United States. So wow. that's what they're seeing. So there's a big cry for not only electricians, but estimators. There's a cry out there for all tradespeople. Mm -hmm. So if you want to learn how to estimate, you want to get out of the field, maybe you're getting tired, you want to come in, um, that's it's a great place to learn. And uh, so we, yeah. we look forward to having everybody. You can always visit us at candlesoncall.com and uh, go to our training tab and see the program. So thank you all. Yeah. It, are there any other questions? Uh, I think the questions kind of slowed up a little bit. Um, Sonia um, asks how, how much that class is. I don't know if you want to point her to, to the page on your website or do you want to discuss that a little? Uh, yeah, the, there's, um, the, it's on our website. We have a program that's, that starts off at $34.95 um, to, to enroll in the program. And uh, it's a great place to, to start. If you give us a call, we can walk you through the, the platform and we can talk to you about uh, some uh, cost savings of enrollment in the program. So uh, uh, it's all on our website. And then feel free to call us at 877-CANDELS and uh, we'll, we'll take care of you there too. All right. And I'm kind of looking around and I think that covers all the questions, but feel free to call either of us if you have any further questions and great. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. Right. I think this one that we went, went really well today. And I, I'm really enjoying this platform uh, with YouTube Live. And be sure to subscribe to our channel here on YouTube so that you can get notifications when we post new videos or we set up a new live. All right. All right. Well, thank you. See you, you next time. Yep. Thanks.